All right, hello everyone, how's it going? Team here, I hope you're having a nice weekend. And uh, this is BXS Weekly, episode number 30. So today is actually a sort of a round number episode. Um, that is actually way more than I expected this thing to last. So, you know, let's start with uh, saying huge thank you to everyone who watches this and huge thank you to everyone who ever supported me, be it through Twitch Prime, uh, sorry, Twitch subscriptions, uh, cheers or whatever the hell you use, guys. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So let's get to the news, shall we? We don't actually have that many of them today. I also introduced a new section to the podcast called Tips and Tricks that is going to be containing a small sort of tweets and stuff like this. It gives you a really quick small uh, tips and tricks that basically we've had quite a, a lot of them in the past weeks, but you know, I always kind of put them into news, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I just split that. Uh, hey, Veslav, welcome to the stream. Okay, so we are, yeah, we got a bunch of releases, uh, some libraries and demos and some interesting and silly stuff. But uh, as I said, you know, there is not that much today. So I'm uh, guessing we're going to be finished relatively quickly. So let's get going. The first article we got is actually a pretty big one. It is from Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the very person who came up with the World Wide Web, as you might know, or maybe you don't know, then now you know. And uh, he's just announced the new project that he's been uh, working on that is called Solid, uh, which is open source and everything. And they have a very fancy website. And it's a project that is aims to give uh, the control over the personal data back to the people, right? So there's been a lot of tries to do that and a lot of sort of different approaches. And this is like one of them. So this is actually the um, uh, evolution of an older existing uh, friend of a friend, um, uh, full SSL thingy that is actually from semantic web area. So I believe the solid is actually abbreviation from uh, social linked uh, data, which is exactly uh, what this is basically, right. And um, the idea of the project is that you have your own solid pod, which contains all your data, and you can grant access to this pod to the third party apps, which would basically read directly from the pod. And you know, you can either um, Man, I'm, let me try this again. You can either host the pod yourself or you can get hosting from third party like the solid, uh, like one of the solid providers, for example, right? It sounds very interesting. I'm curious to see where this will go. As I said, it's all open source and it's all written in JavaScript actually, which is also pretty interesting. So if the whole idea and the project sounds interesting to you, and I mean, you know, this is, uh, we're talking about the project from Tim Berners-Lee, which means it's gotta be interesting to you if you have any understanding of the web at all, I would say, then, uh, you know, do check it out and uh, let's see how all of that develops. I am uh, quite excited to see this go forward because I personally found Fof SSL to be very interesting um, idea, but it was, it felt cumbersome at the time, right? So when I used it like five years ago, it felt like a huge pain in ass to set it up and then use it with third party apps. So here's hoping that Solid will make it easier to integrate into other apps and easier to actually use for the uh, non developers, right? Uh, but yeah, let's see. Let's see how that develops. So pretty exciting to actually see something like this. All right, next thing we got is our react native experience at drops so far another perspective at, uh, you know, look at the react native uh, development experience, how did it go for the specific company and specific products, what kind of problems they had, what kind of challenges they had? How did they approach that? And um, yeah, you know, so if you're still in the camp of deciding whether you want React Native or whether you want to go completely native or whether you want to take something else like uh, Xamarin or whatever, do check this article out. It's got a lot of uh, interesting points. Once again, um, I think this is like seventh, 10th article or whatever we had on this topic now. Uh, nonetheless, you know, if you're still uh, not decided completely, do check it out. There is a lot of good thoughts in here and a lot of good um, points uh, from the perspective of the specific product as usual. All right. Next article we got is real time crowd guide front end part one. So this is going to be a multi part article. Uh, I believe there's only part one so far, but you know, expecting to see more of those. So this is essentially a tutorial that um, 
guides you through implementation of a real-time application, uh, CRUD application, so create, read, update, delete, using the RethinkDB, WebSockets uh, with a socket cluster and Vue.js for the front end, including some um, SC CRUD rethink, SC model and SC collection libraries that basically help you manage the whole uh, database interaction, right? Nothing too complicated here. So it's a very basic CRUD app, but basically if you can build this, you can build like about 80% of the products on the market <laughs> because, you know, um, as silly as it sounds, 80% of the software existing out there is essentially some sort of a CRUD, you know, customized version of a CRUD uh, app, right? So if you are starting out, if you want to learn how to do that, this is a decent article. It will guide you through uh, setting up the whole app. Like again, this is only part one and this part only talks about the view front end specifically. But um, you know, as the more to come, the part two will be on the back end. And I assume maybe there's going to be part three or something like this. But uh, anyway, so if you're looking to learn how to build a basic crowd apps, then do check it out. This will quite nicely show you how to do a very basic front end for it. Next article we got is, blah. <clears throat> let me try that again. Next article we got is ES 2018, real life sample usage of a sync inter iteration. Get paginated data from REST API in 20 lines of code. So a sync iteration is uh, something that is gonna be shipped in ES 2018, or maybe it's already shipped actually. I've actually haven't checked that. But uh, it is a feature of ES 2018 basically and is a very neat one. So there is, it has a very niche uh, usages, right? So you won't actually be using it every day. But um, this article gives you a very good idea of how you can use it to improve your code uh, with pagination, right? So there, uh, they start the author starts um, by showing how you can actually do that with uh, generators, which is, you know, like normal generators, so you should get the iterator and then you iterate over the generator. And it, it works, but um, a sync generation is actually way simpler. So it all comes down step by step boils down to this like, pretty short snippet that allows you to do paginated uh, querying wherever, uh, like, you know, to whatever amount of commits that you actually want in this case, uh, which is pretty cool. So if you wanted an intro to async generators that is based on a real life use case, do check it out. This will give you a very good understanding of it. Okay, next article we got is CoGear.js, modern static website generator. This is essentially an introduction to the new, um, library or package, I guess, called Gear.js, that is a static website generator built using Node.js and Webpack, uh, inspired by Jekyll and gives you everything that you would expect from the uh, static website generator in 2018, including hot reloading and dev mode and, uh, you know, really fast and really easy to deploy, really, really secure and everything, free and open source, and you can use it for GitHub pages and whatever. So like, just about like any other existing static website generator, right? Um, this article not just includes the introduction to it and description of what it is, but also includes the basic uh, usage. So how do you install it? How do you scaffold the project? How do you use it? How do you compile the project for production and all that kind of stuff? So if you are looking for a new static website generator, then do check it out. The people in the comments are asking correct questions whenever you present a new thing that is just like the other existing things. The first question that your readme should answer is, is how is this different from Gatsby JS or, you know, any other thing? Um, Gatsby is also a PVA generator. Well, that's not a bad thing. It's like if your static website is not progressive app app, then um, I don't know. I mean, it probably should be one because offline is quite important. Gatsby requires React knowledge. CodeGear.js does not. Front-end framework agnostic. Okay, that sounds more interesting. You can uh, use any framework via plugins. Like, so you, you see, I mean, there's probably some good points here. So the author seems to be pretty active in the comments. So go ahead and uh, check them out as well if you are interested. All right, continuing, we got how to build a Facebook Messenger chatbot using Node.js and Dialogflow. Um, this is an introduction essentially into the Dialogflow API. So if you are not familiar with Dialogflow, it's a third party platform that uh, allows you to build um, conversational experiences, sort of um, 
essentially chatbots, right? So it's called conversational experience, but what it really is is chatbots. And it's powered by the Google Clouds and uh, basically just provides you a nicer API to all of that machine learning goodness that Google gives you, right? Um, and this is a tutorial that will guide you through setting up your own server, configuring the Facebook to verify it and say, okay, this is actually your endpoint, which is it's not a trivial process actually, because some of those things are quite tricky. So setting up Facebook authentication, setting up the web hooks, and then setting up the dialogue flow itself and configuring, you know, the basic stuff like the small talk, uh, which is I find to be pretty actually funny. So the dialogue flow has this small talk option, which would allow your bot to answer stupid, silly questions like how are you? You're so sweet, you know, like, it's quite amusing that people thought about that, because I imagine a lot of people actually try to do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so yes, if you are interested in using Dialogflow or building your own bots and uh, conversational interfaces and Facebook Messenger in sp specifically, do check this article out. It will guide you through everything you need to know about that. Next article we got is Overnight JS: the best way to use ExpressJS with TypeScript. Um, essentially, an introduction article to the new tool or library called OvernightJS that is uh, essentially a wrapper for ExpressJS uh, that provides the TypeScript uh, decorators and definitions, so you don't have to think about it yourself. Which, uh, yeah, you can just uh, you can just look at it. You know, if you're using if you're using uh, seems to be very object oriented thing. So uh, if you're into object oriented programming, if you like classes and want to use dec you uh, let me try that again, and want to use decorators instead of just simple functions, then overnight JS uh, might be your thing. I personally think that looks like Java a lot. And this is not something I like, I'm terrified of this. I definitely prefer like simple functions more than this. But uh, you know, maybe object oriented programming is your jam, maybe this is what you like, then do check out the overnight JS article and uh, maybe you'll like it. Okay, next thing we got is react virtualized why when and how you should use it. So this is exactly what it says It's an article that goes into the react virtualized quite in depth. Uh, it talks about uh, why do we need it? What is windowing and how does it impact performance? what exactly is react virtualized? And when do you actually want to use it, right? And then after all those explanations, it goes into a pretty brief tutorial on how do you use it with a very simple list data, right? So if you never heard about react virtualized, it is a windowing um, a library, meaning that uh, when you use it, and you have like a list or a grid or whatever, React will only render the items that user can actually see and will not render everything else, which is, as you might imagine, very high performance, uh, or like very performant technique, essentially, right, and allows you to render, well, thousands and 1000s of items without any impact on performance. There you go. So we have this list with uh, 1000 rows, and it just performs magically well. And Whenever I scroll the items on screen are the only ones that are getting rendered and everything off screen is actually not rendered, which is kind of incredible. So this is actually, if you never heard about this approach, this is how the lists work on the mobile devices, for example, this is a default behavior. So you have to account for it. Obviously, there's some, you know, edge cases and problems that are related to it. And the article talks about them, I believe, yes, there's the pitfall uh, related section here. Mm, the article talks about them a bit. Because this is kind of, uh, you know, the, the pattern, the approach existed for quite some time, and there's known limitations to it, essentially. So nonetheless, you know, if you have to work in react with uh, very large lists or grids or whatever of elements, and you want to make them more performant do check out this article, it will give you everything you need to get started. All right, next thing we got is flocking. This is a really neat article about um, implementing the simulation of flocking things in JavaScript. So it starts very simple. Well, the author talks about birds, but you know, it's really like just the triangles, essentially. And you have this uh, start with building very basic simulation of things that go out from the center, right? And then you start, okay, let's let's make them bounce off the edges. And then you go like, okay, so let's make them separate a bit. And then uh, let's make them separate in groups. And you can actually change the cohesion strength and distance. And then you go, okay, so 
we can play around with other parameters and then we can do like uh, play with neighbors and play with heading and it's all really awesome. So if you've never um, did any simulations and if that sounds interesting, do check it out because this is really cool. I like, I really enjoyed looking through that. I am not like, I think the closest I did to something like this was uh, programming a super basic AI for uh, like canvas JS based video game, which was way simpler than the stuff here, but uh, nonetheless, you know, it's really, really interesting and really cool. Okay, next article we got is migrating from underscore to Lawdash from the Dropbox team. And uh, it's exactly what you would expect. This is the article talks about why exactly did they decided to migrate from uh, underscore to Lawdash? What are the benefits from uh, what kind of benefits Lawdash provides? Uh, how did they do the research? How did they pick the tools to do the migration? Uh, how did they figure out how to properly use Lawdash and so on and so forth? So um, their code base is very big. So, you know, it's quite an interesting use case because they couldn't just, you know, do a code mode and be done with that because it, it was a code mode as well, but there's additional things related to that work. So it's very interesting to read. Um, hey, Bagao, welcome to the stream. Okay, so yeah, if you are interested into looking at the, you know, large companies migrating from one library to another, then do check out this article. It will give you some pretty interesting insights here. Right, next article we got is JavaScript type of understanding type checking in JavaScript. Uh, this is a pretty in-depth look at the JavaScript data types and how the type of works and how the, you know, the type inference, type safety and all that kind of stuff, type checks. Things like this work. Um, if you already know everything about that, which is highly likely if you're not just getting started, then you won't really find anything amazing in here. So that you probably know everything. Um, if you are just getting started and you still don't quite understand all the types and how they work and how does the type checking works and how the type coercion works and all that kind of stuff, do have a look at this article. It will give you a pretty good overview of the whole thing and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. So yes, if you're confused about the types in JavaScript, check this one out. Right, next thing we got is five tips to write better conditionals in JavaScript. Um, so this is an, I wouldn't call it like completely junior level, but I guess like middle level article, right? So you already know quite, quite a lot of JavaScript. You already write it more or less, um, what's the word? Um, oh God, I'm forgetting words now. You're already writing JavaScript and you're, you know, you're sure in your work, but sometimes you think that your code might be simpler. And this is exactly the article that will help you uh, look at a couple of patterns that can make your code simpler. For example, like, you know, using array includes, if you have to compare a value for multiple things, like, you know, if you, you use ifs in here, it's, it's a very obvious pattern, but I don't know, until I saw it in one of the code bases, I personally kept doing this, which was not very nice. Uh, early returns is like one of my favorite things because nesting is never good. So, you, you know, if you return early, that means you always have a very flat function structure, which is always better than having like 25 nested ifs using the default parameters and destructing, or I would even say using the uh, language features, modern language features, right? Because there's not, this is not the only things that can help you make it write less code essentially, right? So instead of checking it manually, you can actually uh, assign default values and stuff like this. So uh, what else is here? There was like, uh, yes, flavor, uh, sorry, flavor, what? No, favor map or object uh, literal rather than switch statements. So uh, I think this is also was one of the uh, things that I don't remember. There was, I, I remember reading articles that was like, hey, you can actually use object instead of switch statement in Redux to make it like 20, 20 times simpler, which didn't actually work all the time, but could make it a lot simpler. And it's more or less the same in here with like maps or objects. And uh, you know, if you're doing something so simple, basically as mapping one value to another, then it is way better to use an object with the key and values that you need to map to essentially. 
So yes, um, methods like array summary every, this is uh, something that I, th I don't think a lot of people know about them. I think it was, a uh, it was a revelation to me as well when I found out about them in the Mozilla developer network. I was like, wait, there's like dot every method? What does this do? It's like, oh my God, where this have been all my life? <laughs> So it is a pretty good article that will uh, help you discover quite a few ways to check, better check for things in JavaScript, essentially. Do check it out. Okay, next thing we got is the last call for Create React App version 2. So the version 2 is going to be released quite soon. Um, I, the, <laughs> the amusing thing is that actually this ticket was opened three days ago and it says... Uh, it's going to be tagged v2 and uh, tagged latest and npm tomorrow, which apparently never happened because there's probably some things, you know, blocking that. But it's just quite funny to see that. Uh, but yeah, this is basically last call to give feedback on Create React App version 2. So if you are using Create React App, if you're using it intensively, do check out the beta version and give the feedback to the team, please, so that they can actually make it better. And as you can see here, there is a lot of people like discussing and talking about everything. And I'm guessing, yeah, that's the final blockers ticket already. 21 task, holy crap. <laughs> okay, that escalated quickly. Uh, but uh, yes, um, funny thing, his name is Timer on GitHub. Whose name is Timer? Is it? Oh, yes, <laughs> that is it. Okay, yes, I have not noticed that. That is indeed funny. The, uh, the guy who opened uh, tickets, yes, his username is Timer. That is indeed quite amusing. Okay, let us continue. The next thing we got is towards natural language semantic code search. So in the last podcast, we've looked at this GitHub engineering demo where you could search for the source code by using the natural language queries, like, you know, how do I uh, do a HTTP request in Python? And then you would get the actual code snippets answering your question. So this time around, we got actually a write up from the GitHub engineering team along with the source code for it, which is really neat. So if you're interested in seeing how exactly they implemented this demo, or if you haven't seen the demo, maybe do check it out as well. Uh, you can have a look at this article. They do explain how they uh, train the models and learn the representation of text phrases and uh, link that to models, uh, to sorry, to the code. And how did they create a semantic search system and uh, where to find the source code and so on and so forth. So. If you are interested in the whole area, do check the article out. It is pretty neat and very interesting to read and has a lot of pretty cool stuff in it. Uh, if not, well, then I guess you just skip it. All right, next thing we got is announcing code sandbox containers. This is one of my favorite announcements of the week. So code sandbox now supports server side things. Uh, and um, like, you know, if you're interested to read through the article, there's a lot of details in here. And it's pretty cool. But uh, the cool thing is that you can now go to code sandbox.io slash s. And you can say I just want next yes, or I want Node.js, and you get your own server with a terminal where you can actually like, you know, do whatever you want, which is kind of incredible. And uh, Right now it's in beta, so no private projects yet. They are coming once the whole thing is released. But the fact that you can actually do that is bloody incredible. Like Code Sandbox is really quickly becoming one of the favorite tools that um, I can actually... That basically replaces like majority of things that I use on a daily basis for like, you know, testing the code out and... Uh, figuring out which library do I use and if this is going to work for me. This is incredible, like absolutely incredible. Do check it out. Highly recommended. Looks amazing. Okay, next thing we got is introducing Firefox Monitor, helping people take control after a data breach. Um, Firefox guys integrated. Have you been pawns from Troy Hunt into the Firefox directly? So if you have accounts managed by Firefox and they're going to be going to pop up in have I been pounds, you're going to be notified directly from the Mozilla guys, essentially if using this monitor Firefox thingy, which is really cool. So if you have not seen have I been pound before, if you are not subscribed to it, I highly recommend that you go to have I been pound.com and enter your email address right here and then subscribe to notifications from 
the service so that you are going to be notified about the account breaches whenever they happen within like minutes basically and uh, if you are you know if you have a possibility do donate because this is like public supported website essentially he spends the money to buy those breaches like breached accounts from the uh hackers essentially which is quite amusing on its own but uh yes any support is really cool and this project is simply amazing like i think it's it saved me more than once when there was a breach and i like switched up the passwords and uh, made sure that all the other accounts that reused that password uh, were fixed so really cool highly recommend it and now integrated into firefox which is even better basically okay next thing we got is introducing rx fire easy async firebase for all frameworks uh, so essentially an rxjs based uh, framework for firebase which is really cool to see. I mean, Firebase is very reactive on its own and it was a bit of a pain in the ass to work with events. And I typically, whenever I work with it, I uh, have used RxJS myself and then just wrapped all the events uh, from Firebase into Rx and used the observables anyway. But now there's official way to do that. So there's like existing library and you can just uh, take Rx Fire and just use it, which is kind of great. So. You know, if you're using Firebase and if you are a fan of RxJS and if you're working a lot with asynchronous real-time events, do check it out. This is gonna save you a lot of time. ReactiveX for the win. Absolutely, this library is freaking amazing. All right, next thing we got is introducing Cloudflare Registrar, domain registration you can love. Yes, Cloudflare is getting into the domain registry business, which is kind of awesome. So those guys have only had a really positive track record essentially and um i actually looking into moving to them now so once they start because it's kind of you know uh, i would say better than everyone else out there and uh, they're going to provide like free ssl and all the related cloudflare services which is also really cool and they also promise to never charge you anything more than the wholesale price uh, each tld charges which is kind of incredible when you think about it but I guess they're just aiming to sell you more services, which, you know, makes sense. So um, this looks absolutely amazing. Uh, it is now like in early rollout stages, essentially. So you can sign up for early access and you will get access whenever they basically get more people on. Uh, you can also donate to girls who code with them, which you absolutely should do uh, to get your place bumped uh, higher. I did that. I think there's a really cool organization and uh, it didn't bump my place much higher, but you know, I don't really care much. It's just really good. Okay, uh, next thing we got is another article from Cloudflare. They are, uh, the article is called Building with Workers KV, or KV, I guess, a fast distributed K value store. And um, yeah, Cloudflare introduced uh, workers quite some time ago. We had a look at that article. So now they introduced workers kv which is essentially a key value store in a worker which is first of all sounds insane second of all looks really really awesome so if you are working with a lot of you know key value based data i guess um do check it out because this is dirty cheap just as the workers themselves it is 50 cent per gigabyte months which is like nothing so Yes, if you have a need in something like this, do check them out. This looks really, really good. Okay, um, continuing. We got, yes, this is the last article, or I guess announcement for today. Um, the Hacktoberfest is coming soon. So we are, well, it's 29th of October. So we got, what, two days until Hacktoberfest starts, right? And you never heard about it it's an event to encourage people to contribute to repositories on github um, the idea is that o over the time of the hacktoberfest you send a couple of pull requests i think you have to send two or something and if you do that successfully like if you do that if you open two pull requests they don't even have to be merged you will actually get some uh, cool things from uh, DigitalOcean, GitHub, and Twilio, and I think there might be more partners. I think Microsoft is also joining in this year. Uh, this is typically like a t-shirt and some stickers, which is always quite nice. Uh, but the thing is that this thing encourages a lot of people to start contributing to open source, and you should try that because there is, a, during the Hacktoberfest, there's typically a lot of issues on GitHub that are tagged Hacktoberfest. 
and that are really, really good starter issues. So you can just, you know, jump in and quickly do something and submit a, your first pull request to maybe the project you love. For example, last Hacktoberfest, I tried contributing back to Node.js and it was not as terrifying as I thought it would be. And uh, it was a very tiny pull request that fixed some, like uh, improved some documentation, but it still was an interesting experience because it did not end up merging immediately. And there was like a mile long discussion of the thing. Anyway, it's really cool. So if you never did any pull requests, do try it out. This is a really good starting point. If you already submitted some pull requests and you are a you know mature country, uh, mature contributor, then uh, do more work for open source project you love and get a nice T-shirt. That's you know that's always great. Okay, now we are coming to our tips and tricks section. Uh, first thing is a really cool. Um, Use usage for the HTTP archive uh, database on the Google BigQuery. You can use the HTTP archive to check if your perception of quirks and local content can be seen in numbers. So here's, for example, a query that shows the usage of a check mark in titles of the um, published things, right? And as you can see here, Germans, for whatever reason, really like to put check marks in their titles. <laughs> Like it's it's a bit amusing to see stuff like this. And then someone ran a query that uh, did the character lengths in title tags in September 2018. And as you can see here, there's actually quite a lot of websites that just straight up doesn't have any title, like the zero length. Why? I don't know. But uh, so you could actually do some very interesting data analysis using HTTP archive and I never thought about it this way. So if you are into this kind of stuff, do check it out. Seems like a fun project. Okay, next thing we got is the uh, new thing in Safari Inspector. The new Safari now allows you to uh, create a screenshot of any HTML element from Safari Inspector, which is really cool. And it's gonna be completely isolated and all transparencies are preserved in the PNG, which is even more awesome. I'm really hoping this will come to the uh, Google Chrome because as of right now, you cannot really do that. and. The, like it's it sounds like a very handy feature, especially when you give feedback to the designers, because you know this this could be very helpful. Okay, next thing we got is the Git tip from uh, Matthias Binance, uh, who says, um, "Are you about to open source a private repository? Do you want to squash all history into a single commit before making the code public?" And here's the one liner that does it, which is quite handy, and I probably should add it into my Git config and alias it to something. Uh, and yes, in completely unrelated news, here is the source code for V8 website, which we'll talk a bit about, um, which we'll talk about a bit later. Okay, next tip we got is the thingy that I started using immediately after I saw that. Uh, VS Code actually allows you to drag out terminal from the bottom uh, very easily. So you just, you know, if you use mouse a lot like I do, you can just drag it out like this, which is very handy and I've been using it a ton since then. Yes, maybe that's gonna be helpful to you as well. Next tip we got is um, Git actually has autocorrect. So you can en enable autocorrect that will autocorrect wrongly typed commands for you. This is something I did not know about. And this is something I have enabled in my Git immediately as well, because look at this. You literally, I mistyped status so many times and this literally corrects it for you and says, okay, if you do not control C in two seconds, I'm gonna execute the autocorrected thingy which is great. So, you know, if you're writing it and if you're making a lot of typos do do that to your config because this looks very helpful. Right, and the last tip we got is um, VS Code can now convert your long chains of promise stands into a sync of eight. Works with JavaScript and TypeScript and correctly converts everything with try catch and stuff like this. And there's a small GIF uh, that demos it which is kind of amazing. Those guys are doing incredible work. Uh, the cool thing is that actually this is not a VS Code feature. This is a TypeScript feature, which was shipped in TypeScript 3.1. So um, yeah. Okay, uh, now we're going to releases section. Uh, the first release of the week is System.js 2.0. This is a major like significant release. Uh, if you never heard about System 2.0, uh, sorry, System JS, I would not really blame you. Um, System JS is dynamic ES module loader, which was built to sort of polyfill the uh, non-working import back at a time when it wasn't actually shipped in the um, browsers. But you know, this time around, we actually have the import. But 
Um, yeah, I actually never used it for whatever reason. It never stuck with me. So I always ended up using like uh, uh, that pack and, you know, Babel and all that kind of stuff. So I can't really comment a lot on this, but if you are using it, this is probably quite exciting goals for you. Uh, quite exciting news for you, not gold. What am I saying? Okay, next release we got is Atom 131, which is a minor release, improving usage metrics, improving tree setter, tree view, and um, providing more pull request details for the GitHub integration. I like I don't know if you know if you are using uh, Atom, I guess this is uh, good for you. I like I haven't even opened it since I switched to VS Code. <laughs> it's just been that good. Okay, next release we got is Parcel version 1.10 with Babel 7, Flow, Elm, and more. Parcel is an insane project. It is doing so much magic that sometimes it is confusingly terrifying. Uh, if you've seen the, my dev stream on Wednesday, I tried to use Parcel and I tried to add, so I was like, okay, so we add Babel, we add those Babel configs, and now I have to add Babel RC, right? And then people in the chat like, no, it just works. I was like, wait, how? And it literally just works. I don't know how kind like what kind of magic, black magic stuff they have inside there, but it literally is a tool that have no configuration. You don't need to configure anything. You just install Babel preset and the parser will automatically catch it. You install Babel uh, like proposal package and it will automatically catch it. It is insane. And um, yeah, it just got better basically. So. If you never use Parcel, do check it out. It is a very nice tool. Uh, can be a bit confusing because of all that magic, especially if you're used to a lot of configuration like I, for example, but it is definitely a really cool tool. Okay, next release we got is TypeScript 3.1, coming with map tuples, uh, easier property declarations on functions, types, versions, and a sync await refactoring that we just talked about that is now integrated into VS Codes which is just freaking amazing. Like, uh, you know, as much as I'm not a fan of TypeScript and I don't really like the whole like setup procedure related to it, the features that it provides for JavaScript land is bloody amazing. And this is like really cool to see. Okay, um, next thing we got, no, this is already the libraries and demos section. This was the last release. So now we're coming to libraries and demos and the first thing we, no, wait. Yes, I am wrong. This is still releases section. I should have put that at the end. I'm confused right now. So the tricks uh, rich text editor for everyday writing made by Basecamp is now version 1.0. Um, never heard about it before actually, but it looks really cool. So if you never uh, seen any software made by the guys from Basecamp, it typically tends to be very minimalistic, very neat and very um, easy to use. This editor seems to be quite nice. It supports images, markdown, whatever the hell you want, and it looks pretty cool. Uh, and um, seems to be very easy to set up as well. So do check it out if you are looking for a new editor. Uh, if not, well, then I guess this is not a thing for you. The next release we got is Tabulator 4.0 which is a uh, latest version of the uh, fully featured interactive table JavaScript library. The highlight of the version 4.0, which is really awesome, uh, is that they are now 100% jQuery free, uh, which means that you can now, for example, use that with React.js, which is just awesome. The tabulator itself is a very old uh, table library, and I think I used it like quite a long time ago, and it was very, like it, it does, gives you a very nice tables that you can basically do a lot of things with. And it's highly customizable. And the fact that now you can do it without jQuery basically makes it 10 times better. And yeah, obviously all browsers support it. Oh, is there even like a JavaScript? Oh, sorry, React.js guide? You set up, yeah, there's a React setup guide. I guess my uh, JavaScript is a bit blocked here, but um, yeah, there you go. Ah, that seems very simple. Okay, so it works with React amazingly well, apparently. Neat, that is really cool. Okay, next release we got is DocZ, and I think this is the last release, DocZ version 0.12.4. Uh, the major highlight being the integration with Code Sandbox app, the server side part of it, which is really, really cool. So you can now play them around with uh, DocZ on Code Sandbox. Uh, um, if you never tried them, do give them a shot, they are pretty cool. 
And now we are coming to the libraries and demos. The first thing being is the new website for V8 that contains all the collection of blog posts, tweets, links, whatever the hell you can imagine about the V8. And of course, the website itself is the open source and the source is on the GitHub. So if you want to see how it's built, you can check it out. And uh, yeah, you know, it's kind of neat to see stuff like this. Uh, next demo we have, or um, it's actually next thing we have, is a new book from uh, Ni Nicholas uh, Bivakwa. I'm probably gonna, this is probably not a correct pronunciation of his name. Uh, hey, Samal Habits, welcome to the stream. But uh, this is the guy that you probably sin as uh, the author of the ponyfoo.com. He does write a lot of very good uh, articles. So he just released a new book that is called Mastering Modular JavaScript. The book is available completely free uh, on GitHub to read as an HTML version. So you can just go here and read it. Or you can buy it online if you want to, or you can share a message on Twitter to get it. And there's like a bunch of different ways to get essentially the book. Once again, it's really awesome to see this absolutely free on GitHub. And you know, if you're fine with HTML, you can just read it right here. Or maybe you do, if you don't have money, if you do have money, if you like the book, uh, just buy it and support the author because he does provide uh, pretty good content. Okay, next thing we got is Vasmjit. Kernel mode WebAssembly runtime for Linux. This is another one of those kernel uh, space like ring zero modules that runs WebAssembly, um, which is again, just absolutely insane when you think about it. It is again, experimental and like early stages and all those kind of disclaimers that you would expect. Uh, so still very interesting to see where all of this stuff is gonna go and you know, what kind of directions is gonna take. But um, yeah, running WebAssembly on ring zero is just as awesome as it is terrifying to me at least. <laughs> but it is really cool to see that people are trying, you know, this kind of insane approaches and uh, seeing where all of that goes. Okay, next demo we have is next offline. Make your next JS application work offline using service workers via Google's Workbox. This is essentially a tool that uh, allows you to, or a plugin for Next.js that allows you to add the offline capabilities to your Next.js app in, in literally like one line of code. So you just add the work offline to the config and that's it. And there's like yeah, a bit of server modification. So if you're working with the Next.js and if you want to do it, uh, wanted to make it work offline, do check this one out. This seems to be really cool. Next thing we got is a GraphQL editor, a visual node editor for GraphQL. That looks pretty damn amazing. Um, I'm I, like, I don't know, you know, if you are not a fan of visual editing this, you probably won't like this. If you are still confused about GraphQL or you want a better tooling to, or not better, but you know, different, more hands-on, more visual tooling to building the, um, GraphQL schema and queries and stuff like this. Do check it out. It seems to be pretty nice and it has a pretty slick design. So, okay, next thing we got is React Edit Text, editable text component for React applications. A very nice looking editable text that is basically toggleable with a pretty nice menu. I mean, it's not extremely hard to implement this yourself, but this has a pretty nice design, you know, and uh, basically done for you. So you're looking for something like this to check it out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Next demo we have is uh, Unsplash JS, a universal JavaScript wrapper for Unsplash API. Uh, so if you never heard about Unsplash, it is a website that gives you free, awesome images that are licensed under uh, Creative Commons, right? Or Unsplash license in this case. So basically you can use them wherever you want. And a majority of them are really high quality and really well made. And you know, there's like a search using the keywords and you can find basically whatever the hell you want. And this is the wrapper for their API. So you can use it programmatically for your project, which can be quite nice. So next thing we got is React Timeline Gantt, a React Timeline component with virtual rendering. So if you ever wanted to create a Gantt diagram for your projects, uh, interactive one and you know, with adjustable things and everything, 
looks like this is what you would take. This looks really, really well made. And there's like all the things that you might want from the gun diagram and all of that is interactive. So do check it out. Next demo we got is a hackable slideshow framework built with Vue.js called Eagle.js. That is, um, I mean, it look, looks, looks quite nice. It's like there's, there's a bunch of those. And I think my JavaScript got cut a bit uh so just oh yeah that's the presentation and uh, you know it has a very nice animations and everything and slides are sort of slide transitions and whatever the hell you could imagine uh going with a slideshow thing this one is built in Vue.js. i think there's more than one out there and uh ones in react ones in vanilla js ones with markdown support so if you were looking specifically for the one with Vue.js to check this one out, it seems to be quite nice. And next demo we got is a match game multiplayer, a match multiplayer game to learn German, which is essentially, you know, the memory game where you flip the cards. Uh, looks pretty nice, um, very nice visuals. And uh, it is just 7.7 .7 kilobyte, which is kind of amazing, built using Preact, Socket.io, Hoppy, and RxJS. So if you wanted to learn how to use those, do check out the code. It seems to be quite neat. Next demo we have is PostgreFill. Um, this name is just, <laughs> doesn't sit right with me. I don't know, it just feels weird. But it's a really cool tool that allows you to execute one command and get an instant high performance GraphQL API. Yeah, GraphQL API for your Postgres SQL database, which just sounds quite amazing. I have not had time to check this out, but I definitely want to, because if I can literally create GraphQL APIs over Postgres in one command, it is just gonna be incredible. I wonder, it seems to be like part of a larger project, and I wonder if they are planning to have something like this for like graph databases, or maybe MongoDB now is created a beta. Blah, blah, blah. Um, Speaking is hard. No SQL databases because that will be kind of amazing. But uh, yes, you know, even having that for Postgres is kind of awesome. So if that sounds interesting to check it out. Next thing we got is a web hint VS code extension. So we talked about web hint at some point and you know, it's a thing that's pretty nice tool that allows you to uh, follow the best practices in your development. And they've created a extension essentially that gives you all those hints right in line, which is kind of awesome. And I should install it and try it out because I still did not have not done that. Okay, next thing we got is API.js. API is decay, the scalable web crawling and scraping library for JavaScript, enables development of data extraction and web automation jobs with headless Chrome and Puppeteer. It seems to be sort of advanced wrapper for Puppeteer. Uh, that that is basically gives you a scalable infrastructure. That you, can, you know you can spawn multiple instances of uh, you know we have like concurrency definition, request per crawl, per crawl, and stuff like this. So if you are into the whole crawling world, and if you were looking for a concurrent crawler that can do a lot of work in parallel, then check it out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Right, next project we got, uh, or I guess next set of project we got is not actually JavaScript, but I just thought they were really awesome. So I thought I would highlight them. So the first one is a startup called Tidelift, uh, which aims to be um, Netflix for open source as they uh, title themselves. So the idea is that uh, corporations uh, or companies, I guess, pay a monthly fee to get access to sort of, um, uh, yeah, properly maintained, supported open source projects, right? And currently they have like Vue.js, Babel, Material UI, Fabric, Doctrine, Gulp. There's like a bunch of projects here that are supported by them whenever you subscribe to them. And if you are a developer, you can uh, lift the project. So basically you can say, okay, hey, here's the, uh, here's the package and it seems like it's basically what you get, what you get paid is estimated on the usage. So, you know, if you are not widely used, I'm guessing you're not gonna get that much, but it is a really neat idea. And I'm curious to see how all of that will develop and how much actually can developers earn from that model. So it's really cool, really cool to see something like this uh, going on. Right, next demo we have is a local stack, which is absolutely awesome. So it is a fully functioning local Amazon Web Services cloud stack. 
You can develop and test your cloud apps offline on your machine, which just is really, really, really awesome. Like, just think about it. You can launch the full Amazon Web Services locally with just one command, essentially. This is really neat. So if you're working with Amazon Web Services and if you just wanted to try them locally without installing them online or, you know, if you're offline traveling somewhere and there's a shitty internet connection on a conference, for example, look at this. This is just absolutely awesome. And I'm honestly, I'm surprised that Amazon did not publish something like this themselves. And I think they should just buy this and make this free or like, you know, maintained by paying the guy who made that. <laughs> If that's still, if, if that's not actually an Amazon project, then that will be um, nice and local stack maintainers Atlassian. That is interesting. Okay, anyway, if you're working with Amazon Web Services, do check it out, it sounds really awesome. Okay, next thing we got is the ungoogled Chromium. So I know there's a lot of people that have been unhappy with the latest uh, Google Chrome changes. Uh, and Google Chrome is actually changing those changes and reverting them and uh, allowing you to actually disable all that stuff. So, but if you're not convinced, if you still don't want to use Chrome, if you want to use, or rather you want to use Chromium, but you don't want to use the Chrome with Google in it, there's actually an ungoogled Chromium thingy that basically compiles the versions of Chromium that does not have anything from Google in them. So it is obviously going to be lagging in versions uh, quite a lot, uh, you know, because it, it takes it takes time to actually remove things from there. It takes time to compile things, to publish things. Uh, so do not expect the latest versions, but it's really cool, you know, if you're um, the kind of person who likes stuff like this. It's lagging just one version behind the actual releases of Chrome. So, yeah, it is pretty cool. Uh, next time they will make Torium, Chrome plus Tor. I mean, why not? That sounds also pretty cool. I would, uh, I mean, I'm currently using Brave for Tor because it has a very seamless integration for it. It's like you literally just run one thing and that's it. Okay, that's actually it for the libraries and demos. And now we're coming to the interesting and silly section. And let's start with the super silly things. So here's a Volkswagen.js library that, um, detects when your tests are being run in a CI server and makes them pass. So uh, yes, if you are living in a bunker and you haven't heard about the Volkswagen scandal where they fake the tests for the car's uh, emissions, this is what it basically mocks, right? So the, the whole like uh, fiasco with, uh, hey, it actually emits like 10 times more than the was detected on test. This is pretty much the same. So if you install Volkswagen, you just require it. And when you run in a CI environment, the test will automatically pass, which is, it is silly as hell, but yes, that's the thing. And it already has almost 10,000 stars, which is just, <laughs> and 40 pull requests, which is even more bonkers. It's like, what? Okay, yeah, that's, so that's the thing. All right, next thing we got is the, Yes, the new fresh Facebook bullshit. So um, the bunch of researchers reported that Facebook is taking the phone numbers uh, that you give them for two-factor authentication and actually give those phone numbers to ad, ad agencies for ad targeting. I'm guessing this is only done in US because if they would do that in Europe, they're gonna probably get fined like hell. Uh, but I would be curious to see if they actually is also a case in Europe because I don't think the, the whole like odd targeting using the phone numbers is that widespread, at least in Germany. So yeah, if you're using Facebook in US or Canada and you have a phone number there, yeah, that's too bad for you. You're probably gonna have problems with ad targeting and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's yeah. on one hand, I really like the engineers who work at Facebook and the things that they release. On the other hand, the Facebook as the whole entity is just doing so much crap. I just wish it would die. But this is kind of a dilemma for me because you know, I don't want, I don't really want to see all those people who work on like React and React Native and all the other awesome technologies to just disappear along with Facebook. That's going to be just sad. So I think they either need to change something or, or they will probably die. But um, yeah, this is just disappointing, just disappointing. Okay, 
The next thing we got is uh, Microsoft just open sourced uh, MS DOS 125 and 2.0 on GitHub. You can uh, you can now go to GitHub and uh, check out the source code for MS DOS. And uh, as people are joking here in comments, is WebAssembly port in three, two, one? Uh, likely we're going to see that. Um, the insane thing about that, so if you have a look at the source code, all of that stuff is written in assembly, which is just mind blowing. And uh, as people noted, this is very well documented assembly. So if you're, I guess if you want to learn assembly now, this is probably one of the best sources for that. Can't complain about Facebook. Well, I, I think it's also like the Facebook, the whole Facebook situation highly depends on the country you're living in because it's like seems like they are doing a lot more bullshit in America because, you know, they have the lobby and everything and they can just like kind of scratch it off. While in you in European Union, for example, they would probably get fined to the depth of hell if they would try to pull something like this. But then again, you know, we don't know. Maybe they have a lobby here as well and it's just not as visible as the one in the US. Or maybe I'm just not looking close enough. <laughs> okay, um, coming back to more interesting news. We got a really cool thing. So if you ever heard about fast AI, why is my middle mouse button not working anymore? What is happening? Okay, now it's working. I guess my control or something was stuck. <laughs> Right, so there's the fast AI thing, right? And they have this course.fastai uh, platform. And for a long time, they had the practical deep learning for coders course. That is really good. And if you are willing to, if you wanted to get into the whole deep learning machine learning area, then this is something I would recommend you to go through. It, it is really good. It will uh, teach you how to recognize cats and dogs, how to improve your image classifier and all of that sort of, you know, from coding perspective. It's really, really good. And the longer, like the more you go into lessons, the more you will get like sort of in depth into the theory. So you'd actually understand how exactly everything works and how do you actually improve on the models and networks and all that kind of stuff. So now they are lot launching new course that is called machine learning for coders, which basically goes through exactly what you expect. It goes through machine learning, you know, through from random forest to going like the, um, I don't know what is here, gradient descents, logistic regressions, NLP embeddings and all that kind of things. So if you wanted to get into machine learning and you were just a software developer that did not know anything about it, then this is a really good chance to do that. I can highly recommend their courses. They are very easy to understand and very cool uh, to learn from. So yeah, highly recommend it. Okay, that's actually it from my side for the episode 30. You can, as usual, find all the links on GitHub. The link is in the description uh, of the channel or YouTube video or whatever the hell you watch this. Um, now we basically have a couple of minutes for the chat. So if you have anything cool that you want to discuss or maybe you have some questions for me or maybe you have some links to share, maybe personal projects, do throw them into chat right now. If not, then uh, we can wrap it up here and go have a, um, a rest, awesome rest of the weekend and uh, do something unproductive. What do you think about tech meetups? Um, uh, I mean, that highly depends what your goal is, right? So if you want to, if you want to grow your network, that is absolutely a place to be. If you want to learn something, maybe, you know, it's not that effective, at least for me, you know, it's always find it better to just sit at home and study things. But for getting new contacts, for expanding your network and for knowing basically the local area, that is always a great thing. And there's nothing that can really replace that. This is basically my opinion on it. But uh, if you're going to tech met up expecting to learn something, I at least, you know, my experience was that it's not that like you're probably going to waste your time there. So it's just just go there for networking. Do not go there for learning things. All right, any more questions or things to discuss or maybe news I missed? Stuff like this. By the way, meanwhile, while we're waiting for questions, I wanna note that I refactored the whole repository and now we have a nicely ordered list of episodes that are now formatted as year, week, number, and then episode and number of the episode. 
So it's now way easier to navigate that than before. Uh, huge thanks to the username uh, who suggested that Kevin Coleman Inc. I guess he's just Kevin Coleman for suggesting this format. And uh, yes, this is way better than it was before, basically. <laughs> All right, doesn't seem like chat has any more questions. So I guess we'll just uh, wrap it up here. Come on. Uh, and uh, yeah, okay, wait a second. There's another question. Uh, Tim, is there a solution to deploy images with ExaFrame? Uh, no, there is no solution yet. I am still thinking on the best way to do that. I think that this can be done as a recipe, but for now you can just create your own custom recipe to do that. Uh, but I think there should be a generic one to just deploy images. It's like, I think that's the best way, but yeah, that's basically all I can tell about it right now. But uh, please do ask ExaFrame questions in the Discord chat. By the way, yes, do join our Discord server if you have any questions, if you wanna ask something, if you want help with JavaScript, I am there, there's a lot of people there who can help you and uh, we all love uh, some uh, JavaScript talk. Okay. Yes, to use recipe, you have to publish it to some repository that is basically accessible by your exaframe installation. But okay, let's just wrap it up here. Enough of the exaframe questions for today. <laughs> right, guys, thank you very much for watching. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week if you're watching the video of this and I see you next time. Bye.